Welcome to today's final OFSC safety webinar for 2023. I'm David Denny, I'm the Federal Safety Commissioner and I'll be facilitating today's session. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting both here in Canberra and around the country today. I extend my respects to elders past and present. Today's webinar focuses on a common hazard on Australian construction sites, the tip truck. They come in a lot of different combinations, sizes, capacities, axle and trailer combinations, and they have various ways of ejecting their loads. What we hope to show you today is that tip trucks are not all created equal. So depending on what you're using the tip truck for and where it's tipping, there'll be safety pros and cons to consider in how you use the vehicle. Universally, however, it's vital that truck and people interactions are considered and prevented, particularly if you're using a vehicle combination that's more prone to rollover. Today's webinar is presented by the OFSC in collaboration with Ashi Owner Australia following a fatal tipper rollover incident on one of its sites in 2002. Tragically, nothing will bring back Perry Broad who died in the incident and the world is a poorer place as a result. My hope is that through sharing Ashiona's experience and the lessons learned, we can raise awareness of the dangers associated with tip trucks and prevent similar incidents in the future. I welcome Andre Noonan, Chief Operating Officer of Ashiona Australia, who will outline the incident and the company's learnings. Also with us today is Tia Gaffney, Senior Forensic Engineer from William Kerr Midas and Associates. Tia is an expert in forensic engineering she has extensive experience in investigating vehicle collisions and workplace incidents across Australia. Tia will be presenting on the physics of safe tipping operations, the relative stability of different types of tip trucks, and how this can be affected by environmental factors. Finally, Federal Safety Officer Julian Bedford will join Tia and Andre for the last part of today's webinar, which will be a question and answer session, which I'll facilitate. I'll now hand over to Andre Noonan to start us off. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, David, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge the lands on which we stand and the Indigenous people past, present and emerging. As David talked to, it's a collaboration between the Office of Federal Safety Commissioner and at the owner. Unfortunately, it was brought about by a very, very sad event where we had a fatality. However, before I get into the details, I'll explain a little bit about who Athiona in Australasia is. As I say, my name's Andre Noonan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Athiona Australasia. We work in every jurisdiction of Australasia, including New Zealand. Currently, we have in the vicinity of 4,000 colleagues centred all around Australia with a workforce today north of about 20,000 when we include all of our suppliers and subcontractors. As you can see via that map, we've got a very extensive workbook and order book and work in hand where specialists in infrastructure, civil infrastructure, and that encompasses an enormous array of aspects. We've got a very strong history in renewables and trying to assist our country and the, indeed the world in terms of the push to carbon zero. Looking back, I'll give a very, very brief history. My family's company, uh, Geotech, was started in 1972 by my father. Myself and my brother Bede took over the business around about 2000. And in 2017, we merged with a Spanish entity called Athiona. Importantly, I'll emphasize the fact that we still maintain very significant local Australian ownership. And as a result, local Australian directors and shareholders, which does make us quite a different company to many of our peers in the uh, civil infrastructure space in Australia. We do like to consider ourselves very much an Australian company with very deep roots. We've been delivering infrastructure projects in Australia for in excess of 103 years. More recently, in 2020, we expanded our operations through the acquisition of the Lend Lease Engineering group of companies, which included AW Balderstone, uh, Hornybrook Engineering, Abbey Group, to mention a few. So we've got a very deep history within Australia. And as I say, we like to consider ourselves an Australian company with Spanish roots. Coming into the uh, specific incident and the uh, cause for today's discussion and webinar, it's specific to one of our projects in regional Victoria. It is not unusual, in fact, very common for us to be working in regional parts of Australasia, and this is indeed one of them. The project specifically called the Shepherd and Line Upgrade in Northern Victoria, approximately one and a half to two hours north of Melbourne. It's part of the Victorian Government Regional Rail Revitalisation Plan. The scope of works includes rail control systems, upgrades to signalling, communications and train control. It includes in the vicinity of about 60 level crossing upgrades between Donnybrook and Shepparton, 
Uh, and if you can imagine level crossings, and I'm sure a lot of people in this meeting are familiar with rural rail lines, there's a lot of level crossings in and out of farm gates that don't have any bells, don't have any whistles, some don't even have any signs. So it's the essence of the project is to not only improve efficiency, but also fundamentally to improve safety of people living and operating in and around these rural railway lines. It includes the installation of in the vicinity of around 120 kilometres of combined services route across the entire length of the project. Some important stats of around about 215,000 tonnes of material delivered to the project, which equates to in the vicinity of around about 12,500 odd truck movements. And I guess that's an important aspect to harp on, the deliveries to site aspect in terms of the tip trucks or truck and trailers in this case, delivering material to site, whether it be crushed rock, whether it be sand, whether it be any of those quarry products that we're all used to delivering to site and in there unloading on various sites along a very long rural corridor and immediately adjacent and with landholders and farmers. 96% of the deliveries and movements through the use of truck and trailer delivery. So of those 12,500 deliveries to site, 96 of them, so in the vicinity of about 12,300 were truck and trailers. Unfortunately, on the 22nd of June last year, 2022, we tragically lost a colleague, uh, Mr. Perry Broad, who was engaged by our group as a traffic controller via a subcontractor from Game Traffic Control a local company in the region. Perry was fatally injured when a truck and dog trailer tipped whilst delivering a load of crushed rock material. One of those 12,300 odd loads that were delivered along the entire corridor. It occurred on that Shepherd and Line upgrade project, which is, as I say, part of the regional rail revival. I'm going to now show a small animated slide This is a reconstruction of events, which depicts, we had uh, extensive 3D survey to pick up the contours and the surrounding areas to best replicate the situation as we found it. So that depicts the animation reconstruction modelling. At this point, I'm about to hand over to get into some very specific detail around the engineering and stability analysis. But before I do, just to close out on my preamble of the circumstances, the human side of things is what really is at heart here. And as David said, we'll never be able to get back Perry. You know, it's with a heavy heart that we're going through this. I've been working in, in, in the industry uh, unabated now for 32 years. Unfortunately, this is the second fatality that I have been involved in directly. The first one occurred in 1996, and it's to this day, I don't forget the precise details of how that occurred. But without further ado, I'd really, really like to uh, welcome Tia Gaffney. Tia is a senior forensic engineer who has assisted in this process and will go into some enormous detail around the geometry and stability analysis that I hope and I am sure will provide some very, very significant food for thought. So over to Tia. Thanks, Tia. We just saw a model of this collision, which I'll point out was carried out by Dr. George Recknitzer and uh, his team. Here we can see some screenshots of that model, noting that our trailer is on a slight slope. Our trailer is obviously in a lifted or partially lifted condition, and this is enough to move the center of gravity of that system to the point where we see a rollover occur. I will highlight that this is what was done by Dr. Recknitzer and his team. A trailer stability analysis was carried out on this dog trailer uh, involved in the incident. 
This considered several factors, particularly the ground slope and the angle that led to this trailer eventually rolling over. And this was evaluated using various scenarios of load. So load positioning, including a fully loaded trailer, half loaded tip, a quarter load where we see actually the load remaining in the top portion of the trailer while it's being lifted, um, and then some other scenarios. So those were all tested and I will speak a bit about those in a minute. This looks quite complicated, this slide, just to simplify it for the audience. Essentially what we're doing is looking at the loading effects, the slope effects on our center of gravity. So which is CG for short. So this involves obviously tipping of the trailer, but also the positioning of the trailer. So you'll note here the ground condition that we start with is sort of our starting point. You can think about it that way. This essentially places our center of gravity at an angle to start with before we begin our tip. Secondly, we need to look at the angle which is affected by our base. So how wide is the base that we're standing on, which is really affected by our track width? You can see in the rear, our track width doesn't change because those uh, are not steer axles. However, the front axle of our trailer can have a reduction in this base width, and that's what we could see occurred here. So it was estimated by Dr. Rettnitzer that the angle was probably about 35 degrees in this incident of that front axle, and you can see that modeled here. So that does have an effect on the center of gravity and the stability. You can see, again, a relatively complex diagram, but what we're looking at is CG1, CG2, CG3, and CG4 are all various load effects, CG3 being that top quarter load in the trailer. And you can see what that does to the center of gravity height. So uh, you can see on the bottom image as we tip, that moves our center of gravity significantly higher than it does for the even the full load scenario. So that's quite important to understand. But the results are quite surprising. You can see that the fully loaded trailer, you can tip that up to about the full raised position and you can be on a ground slope of about seven degrees. That's where you're probably going to start encountering a potential rollover scenario. Now, when we have these partial loading scenarios and what I'll call uneven or a sticking load in the top, what we see is we can have even on a relatively small slope of two to four degrees, we can have our rollover occur. And I'm going to show some examples of that. So this is just something really important to highlight you can see a rollover at a very, very, very small slope in the ground. I'm just going to highlight for the audience, uh, some of you may not realize that tipping incidents are relatively common. Uh, this comes from an NTI report that's released every year, and it is based on claim data to an insurer, so it's relatively accurate. What you can see is that tipping incidents account for about 5% typically every year um, of losses. What we see here is that in 2021, there was an actually an increase in tipping incidents. We saw almost 7% of claims involving tipping operations. Just highlighting it's not as rare as it may seem. Very important slide, very simple slide, but I think just highlighting that in order for such an incident to occur, we really do need to have quite, um, I guess, a perfect storm of gaps in our system. So gaps in planning, probably some gaps in the site that we're operating on, the vehicle that we're using, and possibly with, with our people at the site. Um, and so really, if we're able to close any one of these gaps, we're, we're likely to reduce our risk of incident quite significantly. Highlighting there's lots of factors, and, and this should be obvious, that sort of affect um, that possibility of having a rollover. So we need to consider what we can control and what we can't control. So we obviously can't control the sun, the wind, the rain. We probably have less influence on the types of vehicles that your contractors or subcontractors might use and the vintage of those possibly. And I can assure you that none of us in this room are able to control Newton's laws. And so we need to sort of focus in on what we can control and leave what we can't control to someone else. Um, and so when we think about these areas, we can only control what we can control, as I said. And the law says that we must control what we can as far as is practicable. Um, and we must do that using this control hierarchy. So often we start in the red and the orange, which is not where we should be starting. We should be starting at concepts where we are actually physically removing this hazard from our system. Speaking about what we control and what we can't control, we need to understand that we start at sort of a given set of existing conditions. And usually this involves 
where are we in our site and what kind of vehicle do we have? So this is an area that I'm going to hone in on because if we can move this starting point uh, out of the gate, we're going to do a lot to our risk profile. So this is a very probably basic concept for everyone, but I'm going to hone on the importance of understanding center of gravity and equilibrium. So we can see different shapes here affect where our center of gravity is and also our base. So I mentioned that. So the support base and anyone who plays sports would know if you get down low and you widen your stance, you're going to be a lot more stable than standing up. So these are very basic concepts. Now, looking at our tipper truck scenario here, we can see that as we raise this trailer, we raise our center of gravity. And again, this should be very obvious. Now, how can we improve the stability? Well, we can make this wider, right? No, we can't make it wider. Why? Because we have dimension limits in Australia for, for heavy vehicles. We should agree we don't probably want a narrower base, so that would be a bad thing. We're stuck with the dimensional constraints of this vehicle, and that's sort of a parameter that we're going to have to live with for any given truck. Moving on to the importance of our site, when we think about this equilibrium, it's really important to understand how our slope that we start out with affects this center of gravity height. So looking at this top example with this passenger car, you can see we can tip up to probably about 60 degrees before we're going to roll a car. So it's quite, you can be a quite a substantial slope. With our tipper bottom left example, we're on relatively flat ground. And because we have all these complexities, you know, tire compliance, load shifting, wind potentially, uneven uh, loading conditions. So these can sort of exacerbate and you can see that you can have a rollover on quite a small slope, as I mentioned. I'll just highlight this important concept of point of no return. And essentially what we have is when our center of gravity, which is our little red ellipse on this diagram, when that moves past our tire contact, which is our point on, of contact with the ground, we will roll over. And that's really just a binomial black and white scenario. So there's really nothing you can do. If you've moved that center of gravity past your tire, There's you're going to roll. Complex diagram. When we have this truck on the ground, we have an upward force, and this is called our normal force. Everyone's sitting in your chair. You're probably, unless anyone's at the beach, you're probably sitting on relatively solid ground. Now, if all of us moved our chairs to the beach, we'd sort of start to sink. And what that does, it does two things. For a moment, we lose that normal force. We sort of start to fall. While um, in our chair, that might not be a big deal. In our big complex truck system, that falling of the ground surface can have a really instantaneous effect on our equilibrium. Also, we can, if we kind of shift to one side with that falling, we're essentially creating a slope just with some uneven ground surface. And that rigidity of the surface is also a really important thing with respect to our equilibrium and our stability. Another important point is this loading condition. So you can see on the left, we've got what we would call an uneven load. In the bad example, we've got a load that's far too forward on our towards the front of our trailer. This can obviously put undue stress on our hydraulic system, so it can have some difficulty in lifting that load. And we also can see here in the example on the right, we've got an example where we have a lining in this truck. Well, I won't call it a lining. It's actually frozen aggregate on the bottom of the truck here. So this is really preventing the load from being released in a nice controlled way. And what's happening is we are getting our load stuck in the top right, which is the example I highlighted at the beginning. And this can be a very, very serious and is a serious problem for our tipping operation. And what you can see on the right is that our truck is actually starting to tip. And it's actually quite close to rolling in this example. So we combine all these issues, and this is essentially what we might get. So I'll just play this video, and hopefully it plays for everyone. So we can see that load is clumping in the top, but like I just highlighted, we are on relatively flat ground here. And we can see this trailer is just starting to go. And it will, as I mentioned, once it reaches that point, it will tip. Right. Another example on the next slide. A lot of times we are in, encountering what, what we call uneven ground surface or unstable or non-rigid. And, and here we've got an example where our, our rear tire, our rear right side tire, is sort of in a little uh, almost pothole or area of ground that's not as stable as the rest of our tires. We can see a similar clumping issue happening at the top. And again, our driver tries to drive forward a little bit 
All right, so those are just two examples where you can see it really is, is primarily this load sticking issue that will cause a rollover at a very low slope. Let's move on to another parameter in our holistic equation, which is the type of truck and trailer that we have. There's just lots of beautiful pictures here. Lots of different trucks can perform tipping operations. We've got our small little standard dump truck on the top left, and this goes all the way up to a B-double semi and tipper all the way to a road train. I read the largest load that was carried by a tipper was 175 tons and some sort of ridiculously long road train in, in the middle of Australia. Very impressive operations. Almost all these systems will utilize some sort of hydraulic system that enables this tipping operation. And so this capacity of what we can carry is governed obviously by our dimensions. So how big is our tipper, but also how strong is our hydraulic unit? So how much can we actually raise? Side tippers don't raise as high. So we do, have, there's a side tipper example in the center there. They don't raise as high and therefore they have a significantly better stability because we are not raising our center of gravity. A semi end tipper has a separate prime mover and trailer. And so we are introducing this, this articulation here. So we have lots of moving parts here. We obviously have a benefit of increased capacity. However, uh, we are going to be reducing our stability because we are obviously having an extremely long trailer, which raises significantly higher and does raise our center of gravity. On the left, just an example of a, a belly tipper. So it has a quite low roll threshold, but it might not be ideal for most applications. And so I think it's really important to highlight that when we're thinking about why we might choose a particular vehicle for a tipping operation, it really is a, a really holistic evaluation. We might have safer stability on this rigid tipper, for example, lower center of gravity height, but we might need to take 10 more trips in our vehicle. And so our overall risk profile for our operation is really what we need to consider. It's not just the risk of the tipping. It really is a holistic consideration. Lastly, I will highlight our truck and dog, which is the most popular type of tipper truck in Australia. It is a rigid tipper towing a trailer. You can have a two axle trailer. You can have a super dog, which has three axle. You can have a quad dog. So there's lots of different combinations here. But the most important thing to highlight is we have lots of moving parts in this uh, system. Multiple points of articulation from an engineering point of view probably represents a worst case type of vehicle for stability. And the bottom is a, just a pig example. It's a different type of trailer, but it's similar, similar issues. All right, so considering what we know about when these trucks roll, the answer is not much. The manufacturers, and I, I've done this for a long time, will really push back hard to give you the metrics for any particular vehicle or trailer. They will often provide a general number like my trailer has high stability or a high roll threshold, but they won't give you a value. There are some tests here, example, this is a tilt table in the photo here, which is how we measure dynamic stability. What this shows is that most fully loaded tippers will roll at about five to seven degrees, depending on the ground condition, which is consistent with the analysis that Dr. Ragnitzer and his team did. What I'll highlight is that while this is a fully loaded condition that we're looking at, it is not what I would call a worst case example. So it doesn't account for ground shift effects or having one tire parked in a pothole. It doesn't account for those load shift issues, especially that sticking in the trailer. Wind is another one. Wind is not accounted for here and any things like tire compliance or other complexities. You can see rollovers at less than this is the point. That's my last slide, I just realized. So I'm gonna hand back, thanks everyone. Well, thank you, uh, Tia. That was very enlightening and very detailed. It caused me to pause and reflect going right back to uh, mid last year when the incident occurred, where it was really early in the piece where it occurred to me that I challenged myself and I challenged our team and our colleagues to really not just roll the arm over and just do an incident report uh, and just do an ICAM and just do some root cause analysis, but to really go into some detail around the engineering and stability. I'm really glad we did that and the team did that and they set out and we engaged a very fine gentleman by the name of Dr. George Rekonetsky. It would be absolutely remiss of me to not mention the input that Dr. George and his team had in the engineering analysis 
and also to sadly say that uh, unfortunately about a fortnight ago Dr George passed away he would have loved to have been here he was very very integral and led this investigation and engineering analysis but pleasingly we we're able to get a an ex-colleague of Dr. Jordan, a very learned colleague in um, Tia to step in. So thank you, Tia. Uh, thank, thank you uh, in remembrance to Dr. George. The findings and the incident review outcomes, as Tia alluded to, is effectively that these, the likelihood and the causation of rollovers is actually alarmingly quite likely. Albeit there is that Swiss cheese effect where you have to effectively be having it a bad day for everything to line up. It is a not uncommon occurrence. That whole centre of gravity piece and the pendulum effect has been really highlighted to me. And I reflect back, I mentioned earlier in my preamble that I've been working in the industry for 32 years. I'm 51 years of age and from my earliest memory, I can remember at the age of three or four going to construction sites. If I reflect back from when I started in about 1990, 1991, Truck and dogs were common then too, but they were different. And I guess this is also what David alluded to at the start in terms of not all trucks are built the same. And I recall very much the truck and dogs were, were steel bodies, not alloy or aluminium bodies. They probably had a carrying capacity in the vicinity of about 30% less than what they have now. So the whole geometry in terms, and we saw that on some of the photos earlier, has been fundamentally changed from when I've even started only three dec only three decades ago. I talk about only three decades ago, but that's for some of us on this, I'm sure that seems like eons. The fact that you've got much lighter bodies in aluminium trays compared to, to steel, you've got much larger. So that means that you you are actually lifting those dogs from about an exit angle of about 45 degrees to 60 or 60 plus on some of those B double dogs is quite frightening and alarming. You know, it's raised trailers that are, that are known industry concern. The other aspects and key principles has really caused us to think and consider from my perspective and our perspective through our analysis and understanding and really getting into the detail was to, to also say, well, they're very common. These things are driving into residential areas, they're driving up and down our streets, they're sharing the roads with us every, every other day. And it became incumbent, almost a duty, to actually go deeper and deeper into the root cause analysis of the engineering stability because to me, it felt like a, num a number of things has conflated to cause in effect the tragedy of Perry. And, and hopefully by some of these learnings that we can all grab and run with and extrapolate, that it can have an effect that maybe the next one won't occur. You know, a lot of things have occurred to me through this and through my experience of around plant literally all my life, but certainly my professional life of 30 odd years. Whenever I buy a crane, or an excavator, I get a certificate from the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, whereas if I go to Kenworth or Mac, they just sell the truck and the chassis. It's an aftermarket bolt-on and it's a, it's a sophisticated market. There's a number of suppliers in Australia who then bolt on the tipper assembly. It's not all from one OEM. There's a whole host of things which it's almost been staring us in the face as a truck drives past now delivering aggregate to a site down the road, it's so common that it almost felt like we've, from my perspective, that I've overlooked something in plain sight. So we've set about trying to put in place from our perspective, from Athiona's perspective on today, we've got in the vicinity of 61 various sites around Australasia working. And I'd hazard a guess that probably 59 of those 61 are doing this unloading activity of delivery of materials to site on any given day. You know, we, we reasoned that safe planning and uh, risk assess what truck type to the best as most practicable aspect, trailer configurations, prioritise where practical the use of plant that has increased levels of stability, i.e. things like walking floors, side tippers, etc. Making delineated and designated tip and lay down areas must be planned, documented and communicated. Having a safe site set up where lay down areas need to be flat, avoid crossfall, exclusion zones must be set up, undertake ongoing inspections and maintenance of that tipping site to make sure there's no soft spots and things like that after rain events. Engage supply contractors that can supply vehicles that are main, maintained and in good conditions. 
truck positioning and set up straight front axle, axle for the like. So putting some actual time and effort into that safe setup of having designated areas which are flat, without crossfall, which have been compacted and, and planned, fully knowing such as a job like Shepherd and Rail Corridor, and indeed uh, there's a lot of similar jobs which are spread over 200 kilometres. We're about to start a very significant transmission line in and around Canberra and connecting Snowy 2 to Canberra effectively, which is incredibly mountainous terrain and things like that fully knowing that those limitations, but to really stop, reflect and plan our tipping operation. If we reflect back to T's, the highest hierarchy in terms of safety controls is to try and eliminate. And that gets back to the people. And, and this has been one aspect that's really occurred to me. We've got to have spotters and people engaged in the tipping operations as far away as possible. We're putting in place exclusion zones of 15 metres by 5 metres by 5 metres as a rule. But it actually caused me to pause and reflect on our industry. And whilst we've stopped short of mandating things internally, that I, I see a number of B-doubles and B-triples driving on the road, not necessarily tipper trucks as an example. And I go past the Coles warehouse and these massive warehouses and I watch these trucks back in to these very narrow areas and they don't have spotters. They don't have people anywhere in the vicinity. Why as an industry do we always have to implement people to be in and around? I just would really encourage, I encourage our people to try and remove as much as possible that highest hierarchy so that in the event, no one wants a, a truck to tip and obviously there's still a risk even if no one's there that someone may get hurt, which would indeed be the driver of the truck. Hopefully they're properly restrained and things like that. But it's really caused us this pause, reflect, and to be putting in rules. These aren't rules. We're not suggesting for everyone. We're not suggesting these have to be translatable all around the industry. But these are the rules today that we've chosen to put in place. I'd be pretty, pretty confident that in the next 12 months and 12 months onwards, the rules will mature and 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 change. But always challenging getting back to the fact that the, the stability of these vehicles in our everyday use of a very is a very heightened risk of them tipping. Now that takes us to the end of our uh, slideshow and uh, presentation.